Well, hello everyone, and welcome to week 19 of my life as a CTC cadet pilot. This is our first week of module 3, and I've finally managed to catch up on this video series. This is now in real time, roll titles. So I've made it to module three and the vast majority of our class has made it. Unfortunately, a couple of my good friends have not made it, but thankfully they only got recoursed one class back, so best luck to them. But at the end of the day, CGC won't, will only recourse you if you absolutely have to. So they're doing what's best in their interest. So module three. We're actually doing six topics in Mod 3, although in general they're not as big as the topics in Module 1 and 2, but there is still a lot of work to be done, and yeah. This week we kicked off with Aircraft General Knowledge, or AGK for short, more specifically looking at the airframe, so the aircraft, and we also looked at Air Law. Yeah, we'll start with AGK, we'll come to Airlaw a bit later. So, Aircraft German Knowledge, the airframe, uh, so where's my list? There is. So, basically, we're looking at how the aircraft is made and what keeps it in the air. So, there's a lot of crossover at the moment with principles of flight. Uh, so, we're looking into like, the materials. So, you'll go back and look at older aircraft, you'll generally find a lot of aluminium in those aircraft, whereas Modern airliners, we use a lot more titanium, carbon co uh, carbon com composites, so carbon fibre is making a much bigger appearance, whereas it used to be just used in, well, I think it was on the, Air on the Airbus A330, I think they just generally used it in the tail section, whereas if you look at the Airbus A350, Boeing 787, even to the 777 to some extent, carbon fibre is being used a lot more because it's light, strong, and it's very durable. The only problem with it though is it's a nightmare to repair. We also look into how the aircraft is constructed, so you don't want to make your wing out of a solid chunk of metal because it'll just weigh a ton and you just won't get in the air. So you'll have like your wing spar, ribs, long roms, you name it, there's a million different things that go into constructing these aircraft. Um, as a lot of you are aware, I already have my PPL, so some of this stuff I've seen before, but one of the things I hadn't seen before was hydraulics, and that's quite an interesting topic to see how the aircraft controls are manoeuvred, whereas in the little Cessna 152, it was basically you had your control yoke and cables connected that to the flying controls. But with a great big Airbus, for example, if you did use the same principle, it would be it would take like ten people to fly the aircraft, and it's just not practical. So one of the things you can do is use hydraulics to control the aircraft. It basically means you can take a very small force in the in the flight deck and convert it into a very big output force. Only problem with hydraulics though is if you have a leak, you are in trouble because no hydraulics, no flying controls. There's been a couple of very rare instances where aircraft have lost all of their hydraulic systems and the pilots have had to fly it using thrust settings only. Varying degrees of success. If you go on YouTube, you can find all sorts of air crash investigations and they make a great watch. I'd hardly recommend watching them. Uh, it's also one of the reasons why you generally, most aircraft will have free hydraulic systems. I think the Airbus A380 actually might even have four not sure about that, but basically you don't want hydro all your hydraulics going to one place. You want some going to one place, and if that part of the aircraft goes missing for some reason, the hydraulic system that didn't go there is still able to control the other control surfaces on the aircraft. Uh, one part of the aircraft that does take an absolute beating is the landing gear. Again, we looked at how that is constructed, and generally it's made out of a solid chunk of metal. And it takes ages to be made, and it's got to be made in a very specific way. I mean, some of these landing gears can weigh like five tons a piece. It's unbelievable. But at the end of the day, like, again, take the Airbus A380. That aircraft takes off at 550 tons, 
and it will quite happily land in excess of 300 tonnes. So if a pilot decides to have a bad day and slam it down on the uh, runway, which some airlines do, not naming names, that landing gear's got to take a lot of force. And I'm not talking just like downwards, we're talking laterally as well, because if you're coming for a crosswind lander and the pilot fails to yaw it straight, or, or they just don't yaw it at all, then it's lateral loads as well. I mean, there's been a few instances where, I don't know, I think it's like the Dash 8, like a lot of aircraft that Flybe use, they have a habit of shearing landing gears just because that landing gear, it's not the best design in the world. It's pretty good day to day, but if you land it in a crosswind, it just has a habit of shearing off. So these things do take an absolute beating. And at the end of the landing gear, you've got the wheels, which is another thing that we've been looking at. So we've got the wheels on that, you've got your tyres, and at the end of the day, once you touch down, you've got your brakes. I mean, if you think your brakes on your car take a pound in, wait until you see how much of a pound in the brakes take on an aircraft. I mean, I've got several brake discs per wheel, and there's a lot of heat. Again, if an aircraft does a projected takeoff, it's not the actual stopping of the aircraft that's a problem. Once it's stopped, the danger isn't over, because the brakes, they've converted all that forward energy into heat and that heat's got to go somewhere so some aircraft will have like fans that blast onto the wheels to try to cool them down prevent them from catching fire and at the end of the day they're not designed to sit there forever they're just designed to sit there long enough not to catch fire until the fire services get there so if an aircraft rejects its takeoff it's not all over when the aircraft comes to a stop uh, one last thing we looked at in AGK was the flying controls. I've actually already explained this with it in conjunction with the hydraulic system. So I won't really talk about that, but we'll move on to air law. Now I did air law for my PPL and I thought that was bad. That is nothing compared with ATPL air law. It is just, well, the first day was so boring. All we did was look at rules and regulations, different conventions, different kinds of legislation. Um, one convention that you probably heard of if you've done any form of air law is the Chicago Convention. And yeah, I won't go into too much detail, but we looked into various licensing. So if you've got an aircraft, what license do you need to fly it? What ratings do you need? What medical do you need for it? We have to know all this stuff, but some of the more useful stuff that we learnt later on this week was the rules of the air. So what happens if you're flying along and you see someone right in front of you and they're coming straight at you? What do you do? Well, the rules of the air dictate that you both do a turn to the right. Neither of you have right of way. But of course, there'll be some instances where you'll be converging, but you won't be head on. Which aircraft has got right of way? Well, if, the aircraft, if you've got an aircraft on your right, he is in the right and you've got to do take avoiding action. Now in in the book and in the exam that seems good but in the real world if there's an aircraft coming at you you probably should do something just in case they didn't see you. Other rules we've looked at, um, instrument flight rules, visual flight rules, so if you're flying VFR they'll be at different altitudes for example I think it's, if you, I can't remember the exact altitude I should really know this but if you're high up, your visibility must be 8 kilometres or more. If you're low down, which uh, for me, operating at South End when I was on, on the PPL, you had to have 5 kilometres of visibility. And if you're in a terminal control zone like South End, you should really have 1,500 feet of cloud base. But that's to operate under VFR rules. We also looked into special VFR, which is something I've had a little bit of experience in. Um, we also looked a bit about aircraft markings and airworthiness. So you probably noticed on the side of aircraft they'll have a, a registration number and each aircraft will have their own registration given to them. So for example, if it's a UK registered air, aircraft, it will start with a G, Gulf. Uh, if it's American, it will start with an N, November. And I think like there's a few weird ones like, I think the United Arab Emirates is like Alpha 6, um, Belgium's Oscar Oscar. Uh, French is quite an easy one, it's just F, Foxtrot. Um, I think the Netherlands has a weird one, Papa Hotel. I don't know who comes up with these designations, I think it was a first come first serve and some countries are a bit late to the party getting a registration, but yeah, the first letter or two that's uh, 
basically the country of, res of where the aircraft is registered and the rest of it is just the registration like on your car. And of course they have to be of a certain size, width, they have to be displayed in a certain part of the aircraft. So for example, the, the registration has to be on the tail of the aircraft, the letters have to be at least 30 centimetres high. And if it's on the underside of the wing, it's the same thing, but they have to be even bigger, it's things like 50 centimetres. But as you can tell, air law, not a very interesting subject, but thankfully it's only a four day course. So yeah, hopefully we'll survive that. I mean, we've done two days so far, so we're halfway through. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's week 19 all done. I'm, Still pretty knackered from mod two to be honest. I mean I didn't I mean I've had a few days off but I've not really recovered so this weekend I'm gonna be not going too mad. I mean we've got to sort our visas out for the States, so yeah, probably a little trip to the photo booth. Put loads of money into a machine for one photo, but there we go, it has to be done. There's loads of paperwork, but I'm not gonna go mad this week, I'm feeling pretty tired. So that was week 19. I mean, I've finally caught up with all my videos. I've just recorded, this is the fourth video I've just recorded back to back. So I'm all up to date. So next week um, we've got, I think it's actually the same as this week, AGK and Airdor. So, but I think we're going to be learning more about the systems in AGK and Airdor. I don't really want to know what I'm learning that in those two days. So, yeah. Probably not going to be too enthusiastic next week, but look on the bright side, at least the end of next week I'll be done in air law. Just notice this video is dragging on a bit, so feel free to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and if you feel like you know someone who would benefit from watching this, this video series, feel free to share it with them. As always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again next week. Bye bye.